season still rain. Hey, this is John Preston, Marine Combat Veteran and Pacific Records Recording Artist. Hi, just reaching out to have you check out our new album, Battle Cry, Songs of America's Heroes, an album featuring phenomenal other combat veteran artists like Scott Brown of the Scooter Brown Band, Brian Weaver, Rowdy Johnson, just an incredible mix of people. This is all veterans telling our stories and our lives, and we're giving 100% of our proceeds to the Valkyrie Initiative to help veterans and first responders integrate back into society. I, myself, I've battled with post-traumatic stress for many years and lost my own brother, a Marine Corps veteran, to suicide. I ask that you step with us and make this happen. We are in pre-order right now and release on March 17th. Go to iTunes, go to Amazon, bye, bye, bye. We plan on making the charts and making it at a very high level, and your support right now makes a difference. This is the release of my new song, Superman Falls, which is actually about the loss of my own brother, which happened last year, and I would love for everyone to check it out, to listen, and hopefully it'll make a difference in Anyways. Here's George Foreman with Invent Health. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at Invent Help. Call Invent Help today for free information. Invent Help has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. Invent Help can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas if you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies you should call invent help today for free information listen i can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea but i believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot put invent help in your corner get your free inventors information call 1-800-353-6490 that's 1-800-353-6490 again 1-800-353-6490 KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. The world 
around us is an amazing place filled with beauty and with science. But let's face it, sometimes the science can be so confusing that it takes a PhD to understand it. Well, you're in luck. I just happen to have a PhD. Come and take a seat. Perhaps I can explain the world around us in a way we all can understand. Welcome to Conversations in Science. I'm Dr. Judy L. Moore. Call me Doc. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Conversations in Science. I am Dr. Judy L. Moore, and as my intro says, I do have a PhD. For those of you who are new to the show, the way it works is that I do my best to keep the techno babble right down to a manageable level so everyone can understand the science going along. But to help me with this, I have my producer, Jesse Standers. Jesse, where are you? What's up, Doc? Hey, Jess. Jesse's job is to make sure that I don't go too technical and so everyone can understand. Right, Jesse, a couple months ago, we were talking about global warming and climate change. Do you remember that? Of course, Doc. I remember all your episodes. (laughs) Well, I have had some very interesting things come across my news feeds. Some of them are just crazy land, where others of them are really good ideas that could potentially work and solve some very real environmental issues. Cool. I've seen some real ghastly things to something, to a few things I think might work, Doc, but you know me, I don't get all the science behind it. That's what you're here for. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm here for. Right. So for those who didn't actually hear our episode back from February, where we were talking about global warming and the science behind what climate change is, I just want to do a quick rehash. Global warming And climate change, although they're related, they're not the same thing. Climate change is talking about anything that is going through and infecting our ability to produce food and our weather patterns within our local climate areas. So that's what climate change is. Global warming just happens to be part of the equation When we're talking about global warming, we're talking about the effects that greenhouse gases have on our planet. Greenhouse gases is any gas that will take a energy source of some description and convert it into energy. So I'm talking about things like carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, and water. Yes, folks, water is a greenhouse gas. What it does is it absorbs the energy from the sun and stores it up and then releases it in the form of heat. It also reflects whatever heat's coming back from our surface back down and keeps the heat in as well. So it acts like a blanket on our planet. And that's what these global, these greenhouse gases do, is they act like a blanket to our planet. Without them, we would freeze to death. We would have a surface temperature of about minus 18 degrees. I don't care where you are. That's cold. Okay, Doc, minus 18 degrees Celsius, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's freezing. (laughs) That is freezing, and I think that's really cold, but I think the only thing colder would be the, what, Kelvin scale or something weird like that that we don't all, aren't all familiar with. Oh, if you want me to go into Kelvin, I can explain Kelvin, but I don't think we need to, do we? Not today, Doc. We'll save that for another show. We'll we'll have to do something on measurements. (laughs) Maybe we will. Okay. So without greenhouse gases, we would freeze. So greenhouse gas is good. The amount of greenhouse gases, not so good. Because we are actually storing more of that energy and we are basically warming up. Most scientists can agree that Global warming is a happening thing. That climate change is a happening thing. What they can agree on, what no one can agree on, is how much of an influence that human beings have had in this equation. Have we really damaged things to beyond the point where we cannot recover? I don't know. Have we taken things so outside of the range with our 
industrial evolution that the earth itself is not going to be able to recover. I don't know. But that's the problem. Scientists cannot agree on that particular issue. Saying that, though, because scientists do agree that it is an issue and that we need to be looking at various different environmental issues, there's some really cool technologies that are coming out, but then we've also got the crazies that have come in. So where do we want to start, Jess? Do we want to start with some of the crazies or do we want to start with the technologies that are actually have a shot at working? Why don't we start with the <clears throat> the obscure and the ghastly and work the g- obscure, ghastly and crazy and work our way to the stuff that might actually do some do some good so we can end on a positive note, Doc. Okay, that sounds cool. All right, so let's start with hmm, I don't know. You like your steak. I like my steak. I know a lot of people like their steaks. So let's start with steaks. Sounds yummy, yeah. Doc. Pass the A1. Okay. So there's quite a few people out there that understand and realize that cows fart. They produce methane gas and quite considerably. In fact, it turns out that the meat industry has actually contributing to um, various different factors of carbon dioxide and our global warming issues by about 18%. Wow, Doc. I hadn't heard that number before. That's pretty insane. Yeah, and it, but that is not just cow farts that is going into this. This is also through their fertilizers, through the animal manure, through transport, through the actual full meat industry as a whole. It's about 18%. Now, that's a big, big number. And the solution that people have come up with this to deal with this is that we just kill all the cows and that everybody goes instantly vegetarian. Uh, Don't take away my beef, people. (laughs) Yeah, no, sorry. You're going to struggle in a big way to take away the meat from a lot of people's diet, including mine. I'm sorry. I like my meat. End of story. I do like my meat. But there's another issue with this. If we go through and we decide to kill all the cows, well... One of the byproducts of the decomposition process is methane gas. Okay, so they're killing the cows to get rid of the farts, which are methane gas, and they're going to make more methane, at least in the short term, right, Doc? That we still can't do anything. They're just going to make the situation even worse. The thing is, is the decomposition process is not just cows as well, okay? Hey, Doc, before anything we get off the decomp- beef... California's gone crazy again. You ready for this one? Okay, tell me. They're taxing farmers on cow farts. How do they measure that? I don't know, and I'm not sure I want to be the guy that has to insert the measurement tool (laughs) into the business end of the cow either. I I think it's a per head of cattle tax. That, I suppose, would make sense, but... But measuring, oh, no, how would they measure that? I don't, I don't, no, no, okay. Like I said, okay, the, California's gone crazy again, Doc. Okay, no, I, I suppose I can understand where they're coming from. And, but it's not the solution. It really isn't. Especially when you consider that there are parts of, say, the Amazon forest that have actually got local levels of methane that are quite high compared to other areas. And these are areas where you've got a lot of decomposition from the forest itself. Yes, folks, when trees fall down and they decompose, guess what? They produce methane too. So basically, it's a Doc... byproduct of decomposition. Basically, what you're saying is we'd have to stop all decomposition on the planet and the cow farts to get rid of methane. Yeah. Uh, guys, not gonna happen. No, it's not gonna happen. And that's why that particular idea, dare I say it, is cuckoo land. It's not quite right. (laughs) I think the cows agree with you. (laughs) Okay. Some of the other interesting ideas that have been out there is... 
Well, carbon dioxide is a glow. It's a greenhouse gas. Okay, so it warms the atmosphere. But there are some other things out there that cool the atmosphere, and we did talk about this briefly in the last in our February episode, because just after World War II, there was actually a moment where there was a period in time where we actually had a global cooling, not a global warming, a global cooling. And what it was, is it was an effect of the amount of sulfates that were being ejected into the atmosphere through fertilizers and a whole bunch of other little activities that we were doing just after World War II. Okay. So sulfates are cooling. So the idea was, well, to counter, to offset the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, let's eject sulfur into the atmosphere. Let's eject sulfates up there and it will balance itself out. Yeah, okay. Wait a minute. First of all, can't our planet do a good enough job balancing itself out? And why do we want to fool with this anyway? And how would you even get them get the sulfates into the atmosphere without causing harm somewhere else? Okay. You see the problems. The planet is struggling to counteract what the amount of carbon dioxide that is up there, which is one of the reasons why people and researchers are seriously looking at the carbon dioxide issues. And I'll come to some of the technologies that they're doing that really have a shot at working in a moment. But ejecting sulfur or sulfates into the atmosphere using aerosols and other things, this is going to have a problem from a variety of different aspects. Basically, what they're talking about is they're talking about mimicking the effects that happen after a volcanic eruption. Because when a volcano erupts, it ejects sulfates into the atmosphere. Right. But, Doc, last episode, didn't you say that sulfates in the atmosphere, when it rains make acid sulfuric acid and cause acid rain? Bingo! <laughs> Houston! Yeah, exactly. We have a problem. Yeah, exactly. So ejecting sulfates into the atmosphere, you're going to cause a major issue with acid rain. You're going to you're going to accelerate this climate change issue because you're basically going to be burning everything on the ground because you're dumping acid on top of it. You're going to cause issues with our breathing because you're affecting the quality of our of our air, which is not all that fantastic in parts of the world anyway. It's just one massive problem after another. So sulfates into the atmosphere, while it will have a cooling effect, will actually create a whole bunch of other problems that we just do not need to go down that road. <laughs> You're having fun with the sound effects today, aren't you? I had to bounce that di- idea right on <laughs> out of here, Doc. Yeah, that idea has to go. All right. So carbon dioxide, there's a lot out there. That's the main baddie that we're all looking at. Never mind, there's other other gases that might need to be looked at, but that's the one they're all looking at. There is some very successful research that's coming out of Oak Ridge National Laboratory where they're taking water that has absorbed carbon dioxide into it. So like the oceans, the oceans actually work as like a sponge, a carbon dioxide sponge, and they absorb carbon dioxide. And what they're doing at Oak Ridge National Laboratory is they're taking this water that has carbon dioxide in it and have successfully converted it to ethanol. Hey, Doc, that's Eth- pure alcohol. It is. It is a fuel source within itself. We can use it in our cars. In fact, I think you and I have had these conversations about this, saying that they're putting ethanol in petrol nowadays as one of the mixes going into it, so it's not pure oil. Right. In this country, it's about 10%, I believe. Now, you can still find this stuff without it. It's just harder, rarer, and costs more. So there you go. So the petro- the petroleum industry has realized that ethanol can be used to actually improve the efficiency and the, bo- the burning of the coal. Because when ethanol burns, it's very clean. It goes, it doesn't actually have any carbon or soot 
that comes out of it. It goes pretty much straight to carbon dioxide and water. It's pretty much what its byproducts are when it's burning. And correct me if I'm wrong, Doc, but carbon dioxide is the stuff in our soda that gives it the bubbles, right? Yes, And plants like it, right? (laughs) Yes, plants like carbon dioxide, but they just don't like the amount of carbon dioxide that we have. So we need to actually do something with the amount that we have. And they're taking this and they're able to change it, convert it into ethanol so we can use it as a fuel source. And then we can burn it again, create more carbon dioxide, and repeat the whole process again, creating more ethanol and more fuel that we burn, more carbon dioxide, more fuel. So it's this cyclic issue where we're basically generating a reusable fuel source. I was just about to say, Doc, at least it sounds self-sustaining. Hmm. Now, there are some issues with it because the amount of energy that it takes to actually convert carbon dioxide into ethanol is quite a bit. So they're, tr- they're looking at the research and how to do this because they're trying to minimize the amount of energy that's required to go into the process. So that way what we get out we get more energy out than what we put in, if that makes any sense. Well, you always want to get more out of something than what you put in, most of the time mm-hmm. anyway. I mean, when I put my money in into a savings account, I'd like to get it back with interest. <laughs> yeah, so would I. So it makes okay. sense, Doc. So that's the biggest, the biggest improvement and the biggest – that's the biggest um, – advantage or a scientific advancement that we've actually achieved so far to date about how to deal with the carbon dioxide situation. And I'm actually watching it because it's actually quite important. It's quite a promising that it could happen. There are some other things and they're looking at the actual burning situation. So they're looking at the emission side of things rather than how to solve the issues that we've, the, the quantities that are currently there. One of them that has been around for many, 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 many years is the electric car. So if you don't need fuel, you can use just electricity. Obviously, you would have no carbon monoxide being released. You'd have none of this carbon dioxide, a carbon emission situation. And you would have you would sort of improve your carbon footprint as a consequence. The technologies for the electric car have leaped. They may they have, have gotten better, Doc. Jumped. But you still can't drive cross better. country in one without having to stop and plug it in somewhere. And thanks, I like my big long road trips. <laughs> that might be the case, but they are still significantly better than where they are. And they're getting closer by the day a lot closer by the day. In the past, those electric cars were so slow. I mean, you put your foot down and you're like, can we accelerate today, please? That would be good. The light has gone red, you know, green. Oh, no, it's going red and I'm still not through the intersection. That's pretty much where the technologies were at several years ago. I will say, Doc, we're just running around town locally. I think they'd be a good thing. Now that they've got some get up and go. Mm, They do. In fact, the latest models that have been released from Tesla are actually just as they have just the, they have the same sort of acceleration power as a sports car. Well, that's awesome. They finally figured out how to overcome the, I'll get there when I feel like it. Yeah, they do. And they're so awesome from that point of view. They're also, but Tesla's also taking it to the next level. They're also looking at doing things like smart cars in the sense of that they are self driving, self navigating. I'm not quite sure I like that idea just yet, but that is what they're aiming. They're aiming for the science fiction cars that we've seen in all those science fiction movies where they, you get in the car and you say, drive me here. And it just goes and it, navigates itself and avoids other traffic on the road and takes the best traffic passage 
and having all of that sort of things. That's where they're aiming. And and I have to admit, it's pretty cool that it is going that way. But I, I'm sorry, I like driving myself. I think I, I still like the feel of the steering wheel in my hands. I like driving myself, but I could think of times on one of those really long road trips where I'd like something else to hold the steering wheel just for a minute so I could pick up something I dropped off the, on the floor of the car or consult a map or something like that. Yeah. So there is some advantages to it. and But Tesla is working on having the batteries lasting that much longer. And their technology is getting much better. They're generating and storing electricity a lot better and a lot more efficient, efficiently within these batteries. They're now actually promising to be able to create like a solar power bank for your house where you can actually have your house completely isolated off the power grid, but you still use the same amount of electricity that we currently do within a modern current home. And that's that where Tesla cool. has moved this technology. It's impressive where they've taken it. That does sound impressive, Doc, because I don't know how much electricity we go through around here every month, but... I don't want to give up my gadgets. You know me. Have you ever seen me without a gadget close at hand? No, I haven't. And and I'm pretty much the same. I'm sorry. I yeah. I'm. I I like my social media probably a bit more than I really should. But hey, you know. But that's where the technology has gone, and it is very impressive. So, looking at things like your alternative energy sources. You have a significant number of areas around the world are now using wind farms. You have hydro power stations that have taken off in a big way instead of using coal burning. You have solar power that is taking a massive, massive interest in countries like India and Japan And they're actually now building whole power station areas that are solar power based. Some of them are producing up to 10%, 20% in some cases, according to the reports that I've seen, of the amount of electricity to run a major metropolis. Well, that's That's awesome, Doc. That really is impressive. Now, I got to tell you something. I used to live out in Oklahoma. I don't live there anymore, so for anybody who's been following me around on podcasting, trying to figure out my location, Oklahoma won't get you anywhere near me anymore. But what they'd started when I was out there was you could opt in to this program to have a portion of your electricity come from the the wind wind turbines they had out that the electric company had out there, and you'd get a slightly lower electric rate. And Oklahoma, I don't know. If how much you know about the weather there, Doc? The wind's always blowing. Yeah. Always. Yeah, and we've got wind farms here in in New Zealand as well. We've got one that's just outside of Wellington. We also have, um, we have some that are actually out in the oceans as well. We've got a few of them that use a combination. They do the wind turbine, but then they also use tidal forces as well. Now, that sounds cool. Now, you know what I thought was really cool? And you actually pointed this out to me was the sunflower, the solar sunflower. I want one. I so want one. It was so awesome. It came across my Facebook feed, and it looks like this giant mechanical sunflower. What it is, is it's actually solar power um, panels that are in the shape. They sort of in the shape of a petal, and they mechanically come out whenever the sun's out, so they detect the amount of cloud cover that you have versus how much sun's there. And it keeps moving such that the panels are always at a 90-degree angle to which the sun is coming in. Now, that's actually an important thing because when you're looking at solar panels, and this is one of the reasons why solar panels are always at an angle, it's because they need to be at that optimum or near 90 degree angle for the sun when they're at the height of the day, when it's mo- when the sun's most intense, for them to get the best conversion of energy, the most photons that they can have on this, photons being little particles or little packets of light. Now, 
if you are looking at something that's, say, I don't know, 30 degrees to what the sun is coming in at, then you're going to have a, a significantly lower efficiency of conversion than if it was at 90 degrees, getting all of that sun. And that's – so that's why they do that. So having this sunflower that, that literally moves with the sun – this solar panel bank that moves with the sun. That was just like so awesome. And it was so cute too. And this particular device that they've, they're talking about, whenever it starts to rain, it sort of folds itself up and just sort of protects those panels. So you don't have them trying to collect sunlight when there is no sunlight to collect. And it was just so cute. I want one. <laughs> I thought they were pretty neat too, Doc. I have one. On, I have one on my wish list for years and years down the road, though. And they'll probably have something even more fun then. Okay, so I just want for the moment. I want to just temporarily move to some of the other environmental issues that have come out or the effects. Now I'm going to temporarily go back to Crazyville because one of the things that just angers me more than anything else is when I see a comment coming through on Facebook or Twitter or on any other social media feed where someone has taken just a little bit of knowledge and has used their position of power to scaremonger people. The problem with this is that people have one of two reactions. People go, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. Ah! Or they go, you're an idiot. And hence dismiss anything and everything that is being said as Looneyville and totally ignore the message that needs to be looked at. I'll give you an example. I don't normally talk about political sort of things, but I'm sorry, this one went right across the Facebook as the most idiotic statement that could ever have been said. Chelsea. Actually, Clinton. I think it was on Twitter. Yeah, it was on Twitter, this one. But it's gone through the Facebooks now. It's gone through all the various different news feeds. I, you know, you just look it up and it's just, it's everywhere now. Chelsea Clinton had released a tweet and I quote, Horrifying research shows correlation between global warming and rise in diabetes cases. Global warming and diabetes? I couldn't make that link either. In fact, I think that's why I sent it to you, Doc, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And basically what she's done by this statement is she's jumped from A to Z without going through the rest of the alphabet. And she's just made herself look like she's an idiot, not knowing what she's talking about. Let me explain what the research really is saying so people understand what the real message was meant to be. Climate change and global warming have multiple different effects on the humans and our diets and our health. Let's break this down into little sections. Let's first think about warming, okay? Temperature rises. What do most humans want to do? Cool off. They want to cool off. They sit down in the shade. They don't want to move. It's too hot. I don't want to move. Yeah? Yeah, I'd say that's pretty accurate, Doc. I mean, I know on a hot day, you'll find me either in an air-conditioned climate, in front of a fan, or somewhere where it's not so hot. It goes the other way, too. If it gets too cold, most people are, like, bundled up in front of the heater and going, I don't want to move. It's too cold. I want to just hibernate. Yes? That's why I have a heater under my desk, Doc. Okay. So if you have this change in temperature, you're going to get this group of people, this population, who is going to become lethargic. They're not going to move. They're not going to take the amount of exercise that they need for their physical health. Okay, that's, that's part one of the equation. Part two, global warming climate change affects our ability to produce good quality food. As a consequence, what's happening is that we are now eating more processed foods. We don't have 
the nice, yummy fruits and vegetables that everybody necessarily wants to eat all the time. It's it becomes a, a chore. They become expensive, very expensive, because there's just not enough of it to go around. I think so, I read an article, and this was a while back, Doc, but I believe it was New Zealand. They had an, I think, an avocado shortage or something, or there was some kind of produce shortage over there. Bananas. <laughs> oh, it was bananas. Okay. I know it, was it was bananas. Something. And the bananas went right through. I mean, the, the cost of a banana, and this was, it was in Australia as well. The cost of bananas just went through the roof. I mean, you were looking at near on 10 to $15 a kilo of bananas. And normally, you know, it's only, and a, how many you know, kilos to it's a like pound, about $5. Doc? How many kilos to a pound? Two point one two pounds per kilo. Thanks. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hey, this is John Preston, Marine Combat Veteran and Pacific Records recording artist. I just reaching out to have you check out our new album, Battle Cry, Sons of America's Heroes, an album featuring phenomenal other combat veteran artists like Scott Brown of the Scooter Brown Band, Brian Weaver, Rowdy Johnson, just an incredible mix of people. This is all veterans telling our stories and our lives, and we're giving 100% of our proceeds to the Valkyrie Initiative to help veterans and first responders integrate back into society. I, myself, I've battled with post-traumatic stress for many years and lost my own brother, a Marine Corps veteran, to suicide. I ask that you step with us and make this happen. We are in pre-order right now and release on March 17th. Go to iTunes, go to Amazon, buy, buy, buy. We plan on making the charts and making it at a very high level, and your support right now makes a difference. This is the release of my new song, Superman Falls, which is actually about the loss of my own brother, which happened last year, and I would love for everyone to check it out, to listen, and hopefully it'll make a difference in many lives. Here's George Foreman with Invent Health. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at Invent Help. Call Invent Help today for free information. Invent Help has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. Invent Help can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call Invent Help today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put Invent Help in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 
dollars a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than three dollars a pill. Call one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two today and save up to five hundred dollars and get forty pills for just ninety nine dollars. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two to take your call right now. Call one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two. That's one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two. Again, one eight hundred five one six seventy six zero two. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. Six eighty seven. But if you're having to buy, say, okay, so if you were forced into a situation where you had to pay ten dollars for a pound of bananas, what would you do? I don't think I'd be such a fan of bananas, although I do like one on my breakfast cereal. Yeah, the bananas no thanks, move right along. We can't afford that. And that's what's happening. That that's what's happening because of global change. The cost of this fresh food and the, the good, nice, yummy stuff that we all love, it's becoming more and more expensive. Okay, so if you have this increase in climate change, less production, less food, you're gonna have more processed foods, the diets are gonna go through the toilet. That's part of the so that's equation part number two. So you have a group of population that is becoming lethargic. You have a group of population that is not eating as well as they should. They're becoming obese as a consequence. It is a known medical fact that those who are obese are at greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes. There's your linkages, guys. That is what she was trying to mention. This is what the research is actually saying. The research is saying that with the global warming effects, you have the human psychology that's coming in, people getting lethargic, it's affecting our food quality, it's doing all these things, and it is leading to a growing population of obesity, which there are other factors involved. Global warming is not the only thing here, guys. There's other factors involved. Like the fact that humans are becoming more addicted to their gadgets and spending less time in the gym, Doc? Bingo! There are so many other factors involved, but you make all of the connections together and you can find a correlation if you really, really want to between an increase in type 2 diabetes and the global warming. Unfortunately, the way Chelsea Clinton had advertised this is that connection, that link was completely gone and everybody just treated her like she was an idiot. So people didn't take her seriously anymore after she put out that post, did they? At least not on that topic. No, they didn't. And unfortunately, it devalued the research as as well, which I think was actually probably more of the negative side because the research that really does have validity to it is now being tainted with this negative brush as well. Well, that's a a problem, Doc. And unfortunately, she's not the only one who does things like this. There's lots of people out there that make these statements. And as a consequence, you have people who are in power, global power, that are going, this global warming thing is fake science. Because all they see is these negative leaps that have taken and tainted the message. Well, that's not good, Doc. That's why I like when I find something that I think is for the birds, I bring it to you. I find, I yeah. go, hey, Doc, have you seen this one? <laughs> yeah, so that's why you bring it to me because it does, it just infuriates me. These people with a little bit of knowledge in places of power tainting things, and it just, yeah, no. 
shifting it away from all of that and into something that is positive, we know we'll move away from global warming altogether for the moment because there is another environmental issue which is probably just as important. And I'm talking about plastic. Oh, you mean my water bottle, Doc? (laughs) Yeah, plastic has become a real major issue in the sense of that we have so much of it sitting in our landfills. Our oceans are now being loaded with it. It turns out that within a recent measurement that they were doing on British beaches, that 75% of the 279 beaches in the UK are covered in these little tiny plastic beads. It's not pure sand anymore. It's now a mixture of plastic as well as sand. And that's sad. Well, first of all, plastic is not biodegradable. They didn't put that plastic there on purpose to protect anything, no. now, did they? No, they didn't. The sources of these plastic comes from a variety of different things. Some of it is actually comes from our um at, at one point, we had in our cosmetics, we had tiny little plastic beads in our exfoliants. And so, you know, you'd wash your face and it'd go down the drain and it'd find itself in the oceans. And those are now washing up on the shores. You also had, you know, if you've got little bits of plastic or something in your clothing, because they're, you know, you're using synthetics, they do have some clothing has got some levels of plastic. And Just the small little tiny surface layers are all washing off and they're going into the waterways. We have plastic everywhere. And then, of course, you have the the plastic bags that we get from shopping. You have... I love those bags, Doc. They're, They're actually really useful. They might be useful, but they do have their issues. Well, I do try and drop the ones I don't reuse for some other purpose into the recycle bin at the store when I go back. Which is good. That's a good thing. So, I mean, that's it's the plastics that's basically driven our recycling. But there is a a project that's out there that I have taken great interest in this particular project for a variety of different reasons. And the project is called Plastic Roads. For those of you who are interested in finding out more about it, you go to plasticroad.eu. It is an initiative that's been developed by a group of companies in the Netherlands. The three companies involved, one is KWS, which is a subsidiary of Volker Wessels, and they are a roading construction company. They, they are experts in the production of asphalt and roading construction materials. Then you have another company, which is called Waven, and they are experts in recycling of plastic, and they specialize in plastic tubing for rainwater drainage. Okay. All right. You and got me so far, Doc, but I still can't see my water bottle supporting my car. Yeah. Okay. Let me carry on. The third company is Total, Total Plastics, and they are totally into oil and petroleum and looking at how you can improve the properties of plastics by mixing different plastic molecules together. What they are doing is they are looking at how you can create a plastic box channel and turn it into something that you can use to do roads that can support a diesel truck. Okay. So we are looking at generating something that is made out of plastic that can be really strong and hold a lot of weight. It has some questions whether you can do it or not. But plastic does have different strengths to it. Think about it. You've got your plastic bottle, which you keep squishing, and I can keep hearing it. But then you'll have other aspects like, I don't know, your cell phone covers that you can sometimes use. They're made of plastic. Yeah. I love my cell phone cover. It's great. And it's got rubber on it, too. But it's too long, isn't it? And my phone will bounce. 
and it's a strong cover. It is, you yes? know. Okay. So different plastics have got different properties. Trying to find the right mix of plastics to actually create something that will be strong enough is only just part of the problem. With looking at this plastic roads concept, their main goals were they didn't want to create new plastic, more plastic than what's already out there to do this project. So one of their goals is to actually look at how they can actually extract the plastic from the oceans and from the landfill that's already out there and use it. Because that's the thing. We can clean up the oceans. We can clean up the landfill. But what do we do with all that plastic once we've actually cleaned it all up? What do we do with it? This is a very real possible solution of what we could actually do with this plastic. And the idea is that if you've got a section of road that has a pothole or something that needs to be replaced, you literally just take out that box section, put in a new one in its place, and take the broken one, chop it all up into little bits, and make a new section that you can use for future. So it becomes a self-sustaining project. I think the governor of of Atlanta, of Georgia would love you right now because I don't know if you caught this on the news. There was a section of a major interstate, I-85, that just collapsed recently. Now, no one was injured or hurt because there was a car fire underneath it, and that's what weakened the structure and caused it to collapse. But I'm sure he he, wishes he he had a plastic road and could just drop in a new piece because that's a major artery and over i think 200 i think they said over 250,000 people use that stretch of road every day now i think you're starting to see why i'm actually really excited to actually see this particular technology come to fruition yeah because if they can get it to work repairing roads which is something that i've had to live with for the last six years because parts of my city is still suffering from the earthquakes that we had six years ago you know if we had this ability to just replace the roads and repair the roads quickly it would be amazing absolutely amazing according to the website and it's plasticroad.eu they, at the moment, are looking at the plastic properties themselves and trying to figure out what is the best combination for it to work. And they hope to have a prototype in place by the end of the year. That would be amazing. Like I said, I think the governor of Georgia would love to hear from them. <laughs> I think a lot of people, if they can get this to work, if they can get it to work and work well, I think people around the world will be like, yes, we are on board with this because it solves multiple issues all at the same time. It solves the roading issues, you know, being able to repair your roads quickly. It solves the the plastic over abundance of plastic issue. It, it solves so many things all at the same time. And it's just amazing technology. And you've got the companies involved are – leaders in their field. I mean, one of them being the, you know, KWS, who is one of the world leaders in roading construction materials and asphalt. These are not guys that are just doing it for the sake of, oh, this can be done. These are guys that are really putting effort and energy into this, knowing that it's a winner if they can get it to work. I want it to work. Please, please get it to work. (laughs) I want it to work too, Doc, because I think it could be an amazing step forward. And I don't always agree with everything you bring up, but boy, this one, I likes. Yeah, I like it too. And, and so I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on it. There are some other interesting um, things that, about the construction sort of side of things and dealing with waste that I'm actually excited about as well. Um, DB Export in particular, what they've done is they now have these bottled depository stations where they grind up the glass bottles that they use for their beer and into little sand. And that sand is now being used for concrete to make concrete in construction. So instead of actually going and getting the sand from beaches, you're getting the sand from these ground up bottles, glass bottles. As long as they make the ground up stuff so it doesn't cut my feet when I walk on it, sounds like a great idea. Except, well, 
I'd have to talk to my husband because we he's he brews his own beer and we reuse those bottles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. And there's some but I mean reusing bottles is great and that's fantastic, but for those bottles that you can't reuse, you know, if you if you knew you could actually take them somewhere and they're going to do something that's really useful with them, I'm sure people would quite happily do it. I think they'd be more likely to do it if all they had to do is put out their glass bottles separately from everything else. Because, well, as we discussed earlier, people, and unfortunately, especially in my country, they can be just a bit lazy. Uh, yeah. And on that note, with going through and talking about separating things out, I actually want to point out one of the things that my own city has done, and we've been doing it for a number of years, and it's made things so, they've just made it easy for us. And that was the point. It had to be an easy thing to do. Within the city of Christchurch, New Zealand, our rubbish goes out in three different rubbish bins. We have our normal landfill rubbish, which is basically just, you know, the random things. We also have our recycling, which will be our plastic bottles, our glass, um, the metals, those sorts of things. But we also have a third rubbish bin, which I think we're the only city in the world that probably does it. We're certainly the only city in New Zealand. And we have an organics bin. So anything that's, you know, like our, our kitchen peelings, or the, the scrapes from the food, or any food that's gone off. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you, you have that little carrot in the back of the fridge that just went a little bit, hmm, yeah, maybe not. We're going to throw that one out. You know, all of that sort of stuff goes into our organics bin. It is a separate bin that we put out, and it's actually no big deal for us to just have it. We've got a, a little bowl on our kitchen counter, that every day we empty it out into our organic spin and then we take it out to the road and they just come and collect it. We don't have to do anything special with it. They made it easy. Sounds kind of stinky though, Doc. Oh, stinky? Yeah, definitely. Ooh, in summer months, whoo, the kids play, you know, rock, paper, scissors as to who's got to take out that bin because, oh yeah, it can get pretty rank, pretty, pretty smelly. So where would the baby's diaper this? go? Where would the baby's mm, diaper? What? Where would a baby's diaper go? Would that go landfill? Yeah, baby's oh. diapers go landfill because of what the materials are. So, okay, if all your plastic bottles, which I know you guys use refillable ones, unlike me, and your we'll just say soda cans, for example, goes into the recycles, mm-hmm. what go? What goes into landfill? The things that go into landfill will be things like the um, the cling wrap that's got dirty food on it that you can't actually recycle that. Um, it will be things like your um, – what else do we throw in there? Oh, dare I say it, your sanitary products because you can't, you can't recycle that. You don't really want to recycle those either. Unless you're a vampire. Um, <laughs> Um, it's, we also have things like, um, some of the clothes, you know, when they've like, you know, the sock, the, the socks that have got holes in them that the toe has gone right through and, and things like that, they go into the landfill because you can't recycle those and you can't even give them away because they're, they're socks with holes in them. You shouldn't be giving those away. Unless you're those making a sock puppet, they sound like landfill to me too. Uh, things like your uh, appliances and stuff like that that no longer work, they actually go to the recycle centers. And what they do at the recycle centers is they actually break them up into their components. And some of the components go into the landfill. Some of the components go to recycling. And sometimes they actually see if they can just repair the appliance and actually put it into um, secondhand sales. Yeah. That's so basically those ones, that's how they're dealt with. So they don't go just straight into the rubbish bin. It's trying to separate it out, but they've made it all easy for us. 
And and that's at the end of the day is what it comes down to. You have to – all of these strategies, everything that's out there, if you don't make it easy for people, people aren't going to do it. They're not going to. They have to be easy. Well, I think we've proven that beyond the shadow of a doubt, Doc. Yeah. I think we have. Right. My brain is, I don't know about you, is turning into mush. Is there any – questions or anything that you can think of, Jess, that we haven't answered or that we should answer now? I just have to say, I think the cows. Thank you today, Je- today, Doc. Yeah, no, sorry. That one belongs in the loony bin. Yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> okay. I think, Jess, I think we have hit the end of the show. All right, Doc. See you next time. Okay. Well, that brings us to an end of another Conversations in Science. If you have any questions about science and about some of the world around us, feel free to drop me a line. I'm on Twitter, and you can find me at Judy L. Moore. Or you can look me up on Facebook, Judy L. Moore. Or you can drop me a line on my personal website, JudyLmore.com. I think you're seeing the pattern here. Then, of course, if you are interested in some of the other projects I do, which is the writing and editing, feel free to check me out on blackwolfeditorial.com. But then, of course, don't forget, if you are wanting more information about the science, you can also contact us at the station with the email of science at klrnradio.com. Then, of course, there's my cohort that keeps going through and popping up. You mean me, Doc? Well, for anybody who wants to track me down... You can find me on Twitter at Jesse's POV. And you can also drop me a line at the station at Jesse's POV at KLRNRadio.com. Bye, guys. Bye.